All right, Jack, good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for doing this. Uh, you're, you're well, thank you for doing uh, it. Well, I mean, you know this is, a, you know, this is part of a series we're doing, uh, and it's um, funded by the American College of Trial Lawyers, who have been very generous in, in providing the funding for this. And um, so we're very appreciative of, of them doing that and very appreciative of you taking the time. Well, the question is, who's going to do the one of you, though? That's so far off in the future, we don't have to worry about that. Um, it goes quickly, Pat. Um, my uh, uh, ophthalmologist told me the other day, he said, we were complaining about uh, getting older, and he said, you know, uh, life is like a, a toilet paper roll, it goes faster at the end. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, what, you know, of course, what we're going to do uh, is just have a conversation. Uh, we're going to talk about um, your recollections and, and reflections on uh, events and people in okay. your life. Um, I think, uh, given the the arc of your life and career, it would, there's no easy way to separate out the intellectual side of your uh, of your life, and so the scholarship that you've done and, and how your thinking has evolved in, in that respect. Um, you know, uh, will be a big part of what we talk about. Okay. Uh, and uh, we'll just take that as it comes. Uh, okay. And um, All right. I, I'm looking forward uh, to that. I, I, I'll admit I find it challenging to think about talking to you about uh, oh, all of your uh, all of your scholarship, but it's an honor to do it. Thank so, you. Um, I suppose the best place to start is at, at the beginning. I mean, if you want to uh, tell us a little bit about. Growing up, uh, you know okay. where where and how you grew up, and what your influences were early on, things like that. Uh, well, it, uh, more a matter of uh, circumstance than anything else. But I grew up mostly in Macon, Georgia. Uh, we family moved here right after the war. I was born in '45. My dad at the time was um, doing a variety of things when he first got out. He owned a laundry uh, in Macon and eventually went with uh, General Motors and became the regional manager for General Motors and then he uh, bought some dealerships and uh, we moved off to different places but up through about the fourth grade I was in Macon so Macon was obviously an influence on me. Let me ask you, what was Macon like in, uh, would that have been late 40s, a, early 50s? It, yeah, it was a, a sleepy uh, southern town um, Downtown was the entire focus of Macon. Um, Macon large houses had all been built downtown because there weren't much in the way of plantations outside of Macon. It's different than most of the Georgia cities that way. So it was absolutely gorgeous. We lived over in Shirley Hills on Lone Oak Drive. Lone Oak Drive was a dirt road when my mother built the house there. There was only one other house um, on the road. and. We'd get on the road with our flexi racer and head down the hill, and it was just great. And I'd walk through the woods over to my uh, friend's house over on Jackson Springs. Almost all my friends lived on Jackson Springs, and it was um, idyllic. It was um, a wonderful way to uh, grow up. Went to Alexander III. There is no Alexander III anymore. The building was torn down, unfortunately. There was a park right across there where the Kroger is now, mm -hmm. the Baconsfield Park. And, you know the story of that and the Supreme Court case and the like. Well, that was my park, and, I, and that's where I had recess. Yeah, and uh, we'd go there on the weekends, and uh, that's where I played Little League, and we had kite flying contests and everything else. There was a zoo there too, wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Not much of a zoo. <laughs> and the Tiff's house, sort of at the far end there, uh, they were good friends, and the Kaplans and Kalishes and Karstarfans and just uh, good, good making families. So you're there until about, uh, you said fourth grade, so you're nine or ten? Moved to Jacksonville in the fifth grade because Dad had bought a dealership in, at that time I think it was McClenny, Florida. So we moved to uh, Jacksonville, lived in Ortega. Um, uh, outside of the city, uh, you're not really a suburb, but, um, although you call it that now, but just a residential area there. That was wonderful too. We were on the water. Um, 
and my friends and I would go through the swampy area down to the uh, Ortega River and we'd crab. <laughs> um, well, we do all sorts of things, but one way of raising money is that we uh, do crabbing. So we'd go to the local grocery store, get a, a fish head or some meat uh, that they were throwing away, and you tie it to the string, you drop it off the dock, and then with nets, and we'd catch crabs that way, and then we'd go around um, selling live crabs, all the neighbors away raising money. The other thing that we did to raise money, remember those uh, uh, white stones that people use to line their driveway? Sure. It was sort of a trend for a while. Well, we paint those stones because um, they would, the white would get messed up and the dogs would uh, do their business on them and everything else. <laughs> so we would charge them 10 cents a stone and we'd paint all the stones on their, on yep. their drive. Well, it's a living. Yeah. I would, uh, Jacksonville wasn't, that part of Jacksonville was really good, but uh, once I got past um, uh, grammar school and junior high and in the high school, Jacksonville was uh, not ideal for me. Tell me why. Um, well, I'd already become a very reflective person, I think, and um, had an awful lot of interest. Um, the, uh, but, it, and, but for a variety of reasons, I'd gotten pulled into this fraternity sorority, high school fraternity sorority groups. Um, and that was the, the social group. I just wasn't real comfortable in it or anything else. The, um, when we were in the, in the high school, the, I loved study hall. Um, that was my favorite part of the day. You were the not. one who loved study hall. I loved it. I absolutely loved it uh, because I'd go there. I never would study, um, but I'd, I'd have the book that I was reading at the time, and I could have a conversation with whoever that author was. At the time, I was very interested in cosmology, um, uh, especially creation and universe theories. I just fascinated by it. Couldn't stop thinking about it. Read everything I possibly could find. So I do that during study hall. And I was kind of trying out my own ideas. Mm -hmm. And if there was, an, if I could occasionally see something in one of those books that I thought, I'm not sure that's right, even though they were talking way over my head. I was elated. <laughs> it just, I was at my happiest. Uh, but anyhow, we, uh, we left there. Uh, he sold a dealership. <laughs> Got an offer from a dealership in Atlanta to head, head it up, head up their sales. And we moved to Atlanta, and I had the uh, great blessing of going to Jewett Hills High School in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, Jewett Hills, um, it's, I think it's back to its former self now. It went through a rough period. But when I went there, it was filled with Emory kids. Um, the, the kids are faculty of Emory students, and it was an absolutely amazing school. Mm -hmm. um, and I found my, found, I felt perfectly at home there. Um, that time I was interested in Zen. Okay. I got interested in Zen. Let's talk about that for a minute. The, the high school kid deeply interested in cosmology and then in Zen. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how did that happen? I have no idea. I mean, it, it, so you're obviously a reader. Well, you know, actually I wrote about uh, the beginning of it one time at the request of Craig McMahon, I think it mm -hmm. was. Um, and I, I attributed it to uh, something that happened in the third grade. Okay. Um, I'm not sure this is right, but I've always thought of it this way. Uh, I was... Um, an unruly child in school at the young age, not later on. In fact, I got myself uh, cleaned up in order to become uh, uh, the captain of the school boy patrol. I had a teacher that told me that if you can improve your conduct, <laughs> we'll put you on the school boy patrol. And I wanted that very much. So I... Um, that's an external good, Jack. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I cleaned up my act. But before cleaning up my act, I was unruly. 
uh, I finished the work quickly and then I start walking around to everybody's desk and interrupting them, making jokes, seeing what they were doing and so forth and so on. The teachers would constantly tell me to sit down. You're lucky you didn't do that now, that it put you on riddle and... Yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. Um, and they'd punish me in a variety of ways, but at Alexander III there were these uh, coat closets, huge coat closets, and if, if they had reached their wits end, they'd stick you in the coat closet. So I often got stuck in the coat closet, and there was just one little window there that you could look out of the coat closet, and you're surrounded by all these coats, and I had nothing to think about, and I couldn't be distracted by other things, and so I started thinking inwardly, and um, at that moment, uh, I, as I described it, sort of a self was born, a particular kind of self. And I really think uh, much of the uh, desire to read and to have these sort of private conversations with authors, many of them dead, <laughs> so I, I told people I spent my life talking with dead people, uh, and there's a truth in that, uh, came back to that that sort of create, that the self that was created at that moment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's more to it than that, but it made a good story. <laughs> <laughs> what, so you're... Uh, well, you're, let me tell you about the Zen. I, I, um, I don't know how I got interested in Zen, but there was one teacher at um, uh, Mr. Morgan at um, Druid Hills. He taught political science, but he taught it through Supreme Court cases. Hmm. So that's what we did. That's what I was doing my senior year, junior and senior year in high school, was reading Supreme Court cases um, for uh, Mr. Morgan. And um, we'd read them, discuss them. It was a lot of constitutional law and a lot of the governmental structure constitutional stuff. And I, I loved doing that. I, and I really think that part of my interest, that and my uncle, who had become a well-known lawyer, were part of my reasons for going into law. But Mr. Morgan on Fridays would um, kind of take the day off. He'd have nothing prepared, and he'd ask various students in advance to come up and talk to the class. And he would um, frequently call me up to talk to the class about Zen. <laughs> so, so it had nothing to do with none of the other subjects. It was just, you know, just kind of share time. So, so this I, would have been 1963 or so? Uh, two. two. 62, yeah, because okay. I went off to Duke in 63. So you were doing the 60s before the 60s were really I was, the 60s. Yeah, I, 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 and I didn't know what I was talking about, of course, but you can fake it with Zed. <laughs> and I found out that it was a, a great way of... Uh, getting um, uh, girls interested in you. <laughs> so I kept doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever works. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your, your father and your mother and their, their influences on you? And, and, and at, whether it's now or at another appropriate time, I want, I want you to talk about your uncle too. Okay. Um, well, uh, both of my uh, parents are from small little Georgia towns. Daddy's from Fort Valley. In fact, there's a David Salmons down in Fort Valley now, who, the, the former mayor and a bit of a hero to Fort Valley, and he's a, he's a distant cousin. But Dad grew up in Fort Valley. Mother grew up in Abbeville. Mother's mother died uh, young in a train wreck, and that brought her to Macon to live with her aunt. Um, Dad went to Emory, mother went to uh, Stevens out in Missouri. Uh, mother was going to Stevens for acting. She wanted to be an actress. And she became one and uh, uh, has have some performances uh, to her credit. That, and she was also an understudy for Maude Adams, who was a well-known actress at the time. And there was even a write-up about mom in Life magazine. Um, but she gave that up. Well, she sort of gave it up. She gave up the formal acting part involvement in theater, but she always remained a bit of a performer her, <laughs> her entire life. A little drama yeah. you know, here and there. Yeah, and um, she, could, she could become who people wanted her to become uh, anytime she wanted to. 
that that's an actress's talent, I guess. Dad, at, while he was at Emory, uh, <clears throat> went off with a friend of his who played the piano. Dad uh, sang, and they uh, had a radio show in New York for a brief period of time. Interesting. They were hoping that one of the networks would pick it up, and the network didn't, so he came back. Um, to came back to uh, Emory, finished his degree. They um, met mostly by chance, I think it was, on a blind date. Um, and he told her on uh, the first day that he was going to marry her, and she said, no, you're not. <laughs> and, and he did. Um, and then, of course, the uh, war came along, and he... Um, he never got shipped overseas. He was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. They were stationed in um, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Um, and uh, my sister was born, and then I was born right as the war was ending. And we came back to Macon. Mm -hmm. um, lived in some apartments at first over in Shirley Hills, and that's when he was doing the dry cleaning laundry stuff mm -hmm. uh, with some family money that he'd used to start it up. And before his connection with uh, General Motors. Um, mother was um, literary, I guess you would say. Um, she loved poems, had a, a fantastic memory for poems. Um, so in the middle of a conversation, something would remind her of a poem and she would then do the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, and she's certainly more educated than most women of that generation. Yeah. yeah. Mother uh, went on to do some significant, uh, well, the whole, I mean, not that not raising your kids isn't significant, but the kind of accomplishments that other people more tend to recognize more. She um, worked with various governmental groups in Atlanta um, <clears throat> mostly in uh, poverty housing and the like. But then she was um, tapped by Carter when he was governor to be the director of volunteer programs. And in that position, she made a connection with the National Volunteer Association. The National Volunteer Association was setting up these volunteer agencies in cities like Volunteer Make and Volunteer Atlanta and what they do is they coordinate volunteer services. Well, most of those uh, throughout the Southeast, Mother set up, including the one in uh, Macon. Uh, and uh, Carter and other people actually asked her to uh, uh, run for office later on, and she, uh, she turned him down. But um, she was pretty well known within Georgia politics and Georgia government. The uh, Volunteer Service Award uh, in, uh, in Georgia is named after her. It's oh, a really? June Sammons Award. Yeah. Dad spent most of his life um, selling cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very good at it. He had a charming personality. Everybody loved him. He was outgoing, funny. Um, I think now, Mother had her interest in poetry, so that got me interested in uh, words, but Dad had uh, this way with words. He liked playing little games, mostly jokes with words, which I, my brother and I continue. <laughs> um, and I picked that up from him. But for both, there was, there was just, they, were, they weren't academic people by any stretch, mm -hmm. but uh, they both had that kind of interest. Yeah, this, uh, this isn't therapy, but uh, I'm wondering if, you could describe, would describe what a effect they had on you, I mean, it, it, who you became. Any, anything come to mind? That's hard. I know. Um, yes, that uh, I, you know, I can, as most people can, I think, when I'm doing some certain things or acting certain ways or saying certain things, I say, well, that's mother mm -hmm. or that's dad. And um, you, I really think of myself as a combination of the two of them. Hard to know the particular way in which they influence me because 
they were so gracious in letting me develop in whatever way I wanted to, mm -hmm. and completely supportive of um, anything that I wanted to do. Um, they weren't directive kinds of parents they to weren't say, directive this at is all. what you're going to be. It was clear to me when they liked certain things and didn't like certain things. Um, but no, they, they weren't directive. Um, so it was a, a gift of freedom to, to be who you are, mm -hmm. uh, as much as anything. Now, mother was, like many mothers, she was never completely satisfied with, <laughs> you know, uh, Jack, you're not eating enough, and the next day, Jack, you're eating too much. <laughs> and Jack, your hair is too long, and the next day, Jack, your hair is too short, and you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, um, the mother was the, uh, I'd, I think everyone in the family would agree, the mother was the dominant one in the mm -hmm. family. It was more of a matriarch mm -hmm. uh, family than a patriarch family. And she had such a powerful presence that it would be hard for that not to be the case. You know, one of the things we'll talk about at some point um, is um, your religious faith and how that folds into mm -hmm. your view of being a good lawyer and a good Christian and so on, but were you raised in a religious environment? Yeah, but loosely. Um, we were Methodists. I'm an Episcopalian now, and uh, we were Methodists, and we went to church on a regular basis and went to uh, Sunday school, uh, did all of those things. Um, uh, prayed at dinner. Um, when we would come back from Sunday school, uh, this is especially when we were living in Jacksonville, um, Mother would require, excuse me, that I, I memorize passages from the Bible. Uh, so I'd go out on the back porch and she'd say, come tell me when you've memorized these. Um, and she'd pick out passages and come back in and I could spout it off. And, um, but that, it, it was um, a very gentle <laughs> kind of um, involvement with the church. And um, I mean, religion was important in both of their lives and became more important as they got older. I think <clears throat> as much as anything, dad's music uh, came out more in uh, his involvement in churches. That was his uh, um, his uh, stage. Um, so he sang in all the choirs and loved doing that. Um, he'd been the glee club at <clears throat> Emory and the church offered him a way of singing. Mm -hmm. And uh, really for him and for me too, um, trying to distinguish Religion, music was hard. <laughs> Not a lot of people worship through music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's a way of uh, of um, understanding religion that, as you know, I've I've drawn on. Mm -hmm. uh, I've drawn on that in numerous articles, uh, especially the one that I did with uh, Joe Vining, mm -hmm. which is laws, the the uh, laws melody, um, because religion, I mean, music gave people a way of experiencing as real the kind of thing that um, a re religion can do. Uh, music is there but not there. In, uh, it's, say it in formal terms, it's ontological status is problematic. <laughs> I mean, it's just a series of notes after all. Um, and the law can be thought of in a similar fashion. They are not there. I mean, the law has a mysterious authority over us. That, um, the, the people in dissent will say that the majority got the law wrong. So obviously the law was not what the majority said it was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a matter of force. It wasn't a matter of getting more votes. There was some law out there that was standing in judgment of these judges. Where is that? Mm -hmm. And that kind of, that kind of issue. Mm -hmm. You had asked me about my uncle. Let me mention it, him. It, it, if this is a good time to talk about and him. So, uh, <clears throat> Wolven Patton, and uh, as I mentioned to you before we started recording, that there was an oral history done of him, um, and it's been transcribed and really hasn't 
interesting, interesting life. Um, he was my initial connection to Mercer. He went to Mercer undergrad uh, school and was president of the senior class, well-known figure around the campus. He then went to uh, law school, Mercer Law School, and he was in either the class right below Brainerd Curry or two classes below Brainerd Curry. Comes into the story later on because I was working on a biography of Brainerd Curry. Uh, he did very well in law school. The dean was a Judge Boodle, who you know well. And um, he, uh, they, they became friends, and he always referred to him, he never called him Judge Boodle. He always called him Dean Boodle. <laughs> and he's, and uh, uh, Judge Boodle asked him, why do you always call me Dean? I haven't been Dean for, he said, uh, Dean, I've had many judges in my life. I've only had one Dean. <laughs> <laughs> so he called him Dean Boodle, okay. which was a, for Wolf in the term of uh, more respect than judge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Dean Boodle uh, selected him to give a talk to the state bar uh, after he graduated. There was uh, one graduate of each class of all of the graduating classes of all of the Georgia Law Schools at the time was selected to give a talk to the State Bar, and Wilvin gave that one, and guess what the topic was? Legal ethics. Oh, no, there you go. <laughs> That's so, how all this got started. Yeah, I'll have to get you a copy of that I article. Think. It was published, and it, it's, it's good. Um, so he was interested in ethics. He went off, uh, worked with the uh, SEC. Um, this is right before the war worked with the SEC. His roommate was Bishop Pike. He, um, his uh, co-worker was Bill Douglas, later Justice Douglas. <laughs> there was a whole slew of others that were at the SEC at the time. Mm -hmm. He got, well, the war came along, and people are very interested in his war history because he served in all of the branches of the military during the war, ending up in the uh, Marine Corps <clears throat> in the Pacific as what we would now call a forward observer. Um, they would go ahead of the troops to set up uh, a little um, observation post at the islands where the troops were going to evade, uh, invade, and they would set up radar and so forth and so on uh, to provide intelligence back before the, um, before the landing. Um, but the re that it, it's an impossibly long story as to why he was in all of the branches but he kept pulling deals uh, to get into the war. He was really wanted to get into combat. He was going to be a fighter pilot, and he blacked out. This is just a small part of it. He blacked out in one of the flights, and they said, no, you're not doing this anymore. We're going to put you in a desk job. He said, no, you're not. <laughs> and he went from um, the Air Force then. Actually, that was the one right before the Marine Corps, I think. So he had a fantastic history there which he shared with us often. And as um, he was a very exuberant guy, he had the most welcoming voice you can imagine. It just, uh, you'd walk into the room and this booming voice of greeting and you'd never felt more welcomed. <laughs> um, and he, he was someone that just, everybody just um, loved and admired. And, so uh, when he got back, he uh, was back in with the uh, SEC, but he shifted over to tax work because he wanted to get into trial. <coughs> um, he was on a, a litigation case out in California, and he was up against uh, Fran Sword, who at the time was uh, middle-aged, but fairly well-known uh, tax litigation lawyer out there, and they were on opposing sides. After the case was over, <coughs> Fran came up to him and said, uh, Wolven, I uh, really like your work. Uh, how about joining the firm? Can we steal you? And uh, the money was right. <laughs> and so he moved. The firm was in Seattle, Washington. So he moved from D.C. to Seattle, Washington, lived all the rest of his life in Seattle. After being in the firm for maybe three years, Fran came to see him again. And uh, he said, uh, well, when I got a proposition, let you and I leave the firm, we'll be equal partners in our own firm. <laughs> so he said, uh, well, let's do it. And they did, and they 
set up Lesur and Patton, um, doing tax, but much more than tax. It was a little bit of everything, and the firm is still there now and still doing well. So, as he put it, he, he went from the bottom of the masthead to the top. <laughs> It's a, it's a good direction. Yeah, yeah. And um, so Wolven was a big presence. He would fly in for visits and tell us war stories and trial stories, and uh, people would gather around and uh, you know. And he liked he liked his he liked to have a drink on occasion. Uh, and uh, but he would always wake up very early in the morning, uh, shower and shave and put on his suit, uh, which he thought a gentleman was required to do before seven o'clock. <laughs> so, Different generation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Wolven um, was a big supporter of Carter. He dearly loved Jimmy Carter. Um, and there were other politicians he supported, but Carter was his favorite, I think. And so he was very helpful to Carter, not just financially, but in other ways. Um, and uh, so I, I, when Carter uh, was first elected, I, Eleni and I were in D.C. in part because of Carter. And uh, uh, we bumped into Wilbin there at the uh, inauguration. And um, yeah, so he was a terribly, terribly interesting man. Now, I gather a big influence on you. He, he was. Um, in, in a variety of ways, uh, his personality, I think, was an, an influence. Um, later on, he became an influence for me in law. I don't think he was at least consciously the reason I went, into, went to law school. I think that was more like it is with so many students, just by default. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. It was acceptable to do, perhaps, because of him. Uh, but I didn't really have much of an understanding of what lawyers did, other than uh, through, uh, through Wolven. Um, there were some things that were really annoying me at the time. I read, as many people did, Rachel Carson's book, The Silent Spring, mm -hmm. and uh, the environment, this one I was in the Marine Corps, and the environment suddenly became a big deal to me. And it seemed to me to be the way to deal with that was through the law. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was part of the motivation, but mostly I knew at that point, we've, we've skipped a bit here, but um, we'll come back. I had, I had uh, had four years at Duke that I loved, and I'd had the four years of active service in the Marine Corps, including time in Vietnam. So I was getting out of the Marine Corps. I was eager to get out of the Marine Corps, um, and I had to make a decision, and there were two things I had done, Duke, Vietnam, uh, I said, I want to go back to the Duke thing. <laughs> <laughs> Academic life sounded yeah. pretty good. Yeah. So um, went off to law school. I, I mm -hmm. had thought about uh, uh, some other graduate schools, mm -hmm. but my degree in political science was geared towards going to law school, and mm -hmm. eh, well, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Just to one last thing on your uncle, although we may come back to him from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, do I recall correctly you you looked after him did. Late, late in his life? For about the, he retired, and uh, you'll catch this reference, and I'm not sure everyone, but uh, like Sandy Koufax, he knew when to retire. So I, I asked him, he, he, uh, he I said, well, why, why did you retire? He said, well, we had a couple of trials, and I wasn't a good, as good as I had been. I knew I wasn't, so it was time to get out. <laughs> and that was it. And he got out and left Seattle, moved to uh, North Georgia, built this huge, beautiful house on Lake Burton, mostly to be near to his sister, my mother. And uh, it's really the only family that, um, only blood family, uh, he had some adopted kids and things like that that kind of go on their own ways. And <clears throat> uh, so he, he, he came back and things were going well and uh, <clears throat> he had uh, bought a place. They sold the house on Lake Burton 
and they uh, bought a place in North Carolina. Excuse me, in uh, in Highlands, not far from where Hal mm -hmm. Lewis is. And uh, it was kind of a retirement village place. They were they were going to live there. Had a he had bad hips <clears throat> and bad knees for quite a while. He was using a motorized wheelchair. He could walk a bit, but not well. So he was using the motorized wheelchair. He's coming up the drive at the uh, place that they were buying at, um, in Highlands. It was a drive not as steep as yours, but close, and he went over backwards. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Hit his head, um, and <clears throat> there was brain damage as a result of that. And he lost most of his ability to speak. Um, if you, if there had been one thing that should not have been taken from Walt when it was his ability to speak, because he was just brilliant as mm. a speaker, had such a command of words, um, and so pers uh, persuasive in his tone of voice, uh, and he loved talking, loved telling stories. Uh, it's what really just drew people into him, was the way that he could talk. Um, so that was gone. I think yeah. he would have rather been blind uh, or deaf than uh, lose his ability to speak. So um, there was really uh, someone in the family had to uh, start managing his affairs, and I took over. It was about 10 years' worth. Um, he retired a wealthy man, but he had very little in the way of uh, health care coverage and things like that. And so many lawyers, they don't do their own stuff well. They do it well for their clients. <clears throat> His was all set up in annuities, which probably was a mistake. And um, We had to hire 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, personal nursing mm -hmm. uh, care, uh, um, eventually rented a house for him to live in and the like, and boy, we were just going through them, the money rapidly. So I was trying to balance things yeah. out, keep the nurses happy, yet not run out of money. The nurses would leave and come back, and they all loved him. They just dearly loved him. That was wonderful. Uh, most he loved, some, some you could tell he didn't, and I'd uh, drive up there about every two weeks and uh, visit, and yeah, so. Well, you know, we were talking uh, a little while ago about um, you know, Druid Health High School, and we're, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you in just a minute about Duke, and I can figure out how a good Methodist boy ends up at Duke, but um, were there other teachers besides Mr. Morgan that you remember having an big in high school? Yeah, influence on you? Well, I, they all did. Um, there was one English teacher whose name I choose, an older woman whose name I'm not going to be able to remember. I'm really bad with names, Pat, and uh, always have been, but worse now. Um, she focused, the way I remember her, is focusing on our vocabularies. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted to improve the vocabularies of um, her students as much as anything else. And I think that probably had an effect. It just drew, drew upon the love of words that I already had. Mm -hmm. um, there was, oddly enough, there was a young Spanish teacher. And um, I took all of my Spanish courses through her. Um, and then there was an advanced, there were four or five of us that were put in an advanced placement, Spanish course, it wasn't called AP at the time. But, um, and she said, we're going to do something different. I, I will, we'll talk in Spanish, we'll have our conversations in Spanish, but what I want you to do is read Don Quixote. And uh, I'm going to get you the book, it'll have English on one page and Spanish on the other. And I know you're going to be reading the English, but take a look at the Spanish and do the comparison. And we spent almost the entire, I guess it was semester at the time, uh, going through Don Quixote in great detail. And that was a memorable experience. Mm -hmm. 
and she made us promise that we would reread it at different stages of our lives. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that that was that was shaping in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about Duke. Uh, you, you, you yeah, mentioned well, you say it, it was the Methodist part, but it really... Uh, There's an assumption on my part. It's not true. Yeah. Um, but, but really, mother and dad uh, didn't push me in. You would think dad would... Emory grad and everything. Mm -hmm. He didn't mention it once. Um, Davidson and Duke were the two schools I applied to and I'd have to say, as strange as this sounds to people right now, that if you tested well and you had done well in high school, those were the default schools for a Southern boy. Um, now, because I was at Druid Hills and there were faculty, uh, Emory faculty kids there, I did have some friends that went off. Uh, there are a couple that went to Harvard and places like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, um, the people that I was mostly associated with were, were going to Davidson do. Um, it may have been a teacher that mentioned it to me, but it's kind of what you did as a Southerner. Okay. So I applied to both, I got accepted, I got a scholarship from Davidson, didn't get a scholarship from Duke, but I uh, had applied, and there's a story behind this, that for a Navy scholarship. And I'd gotten uh, the Navy scholarship. Uh, the Navy didn't care where I went to school as long as they had a Navy ROTC program. And uh, so uh, Duke had a Navy ROTC program, Davidson didn't. And I, I, I didn't even visit the schools. Uh, I just decided, well, I'll go to Duke. I don't think about this a whole lot. It's not like it is now. Right, not at all. I, when we took my son Lanier on his college tour, we went to all of these different schools, spent hours and hours in the evenings researching the schools. We had the, the tours with the kid walking backwards and explaining things. And, uh, he knew more about those schools than I did a after I graduated from Duke. <laughs> um, and we come back from this trip and I said, well, Lanier, what do you think? I don't know enough. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know yeah. enough? <laughs> it's a different time, Dad. Yeah. yeah. So it was, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Duke. And, uh, now tell me, the, why, there's nothing you've said so far about your upbringing or who you were at that stage in life to suggest a military yeah, interest. I mean, how, how did that happen? Yeah. Um, well, the, the only connection with the military, my father had been in during the war. Yeah, but everybody's had father yeah, everybody. had been in the war. And then, and Wilbur would tell us all his military stories. But uh, my sister, Sandy, had a boyfriend, Sidney, who got a Navy scholarship. And he talked to me about this. Um, and uh, I, the Navy <laughs> scholarship covered everything. It covered all of your tuition. It gave, covered, bought your books, bought your uniforms and all the Navy requirements, gave you spending money. And I thought that um, this would be a nice thing to do for the parents. Okay. Um, that they wouldn't have to lay out a whole bunch of money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was more of that. Mm -hmm. And at that age, the idea that I owed the military six years after graduation, <laughs> just, eh, six years. <laughs> and and that, that, that little place in Southeast Asia had yeah, not no, entered your radar. Yeah, no, there was nothing like that on the horizon, uh, yeah. And then actually when I, uh, when I uh, got to uh, the Duke, my uh, roommate at Duke, Al Kyle, my freshman roommate, his father was General Kyle, who's a well-known general in the uh, Marine Corps. And um, one of my uh, uh, fraternity brothers, one of the older fraternity brothers mm -hmm. was um, Walt Chapman, whose uh, dad became the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Now these were both General's kids, and I don't know how much you know about the military, but they take care of their Generals. Uh, the Generals I don't really live in these gorgeous houses, but they have support staff that live with them. 
And uh, so these kids knew the Marine Corps from a completely different perspective that didn't occur to me at the time. Mm -hmm. The way they described the Marine Corps to me was, well, you sort of, you know, you go off and you do a little office stuff and then you kind of hang around the oak club and <laughs> the pool and it's, you know, it's great. <laughs> you can do that. You, you could do this standing on your head underwater for four years. It's not, <laughs> you know, yeah. and yeah, there's some rough stuff at the beginning, the training and everything. And, but, uh, yeah. And that appealed to me. I had uh, been on a couple of Navy cruises um, that I, uh, I didn't care for. Um, the cramped quarters, I was on a tin can, but the Navy called a destroyer, and in cramped quarters with people you don't know well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got sick on one of them, and uh, so I said, ah, I don't, this is not for me. Yeah. I would get so restless that, you know, no place to run, no place to... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah too much like the cloakroom back at uh, yeah. Alexander Three. Um, Except for a bunch of people around. Yeah, that too. Um, you, you said before you, you, you loved your four years at Duke. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, tell, I, just, I, was, I was happy as could be. Yeah, tell, tell me why and, and tell me what that I loved, uh, did studying. for you later. You loved studying. Well, that's the kid you were. Yeah, right? I just loved academics. I loved um, the... Uh, I had more friends who were more interested in the same sort of stuff that I was interested in. A lot of music friends um, who were exploring different kinds of music. A lot of literary friends who were exploring different kinds of uh, writing. Um, so the, the, whole, the whole atmosphere there was good towards, um, for someone like me who um, just compelled to try to figure things out. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but just compelled to try to figure things out. Wonderful friends there. Uh, it's a glorious campus. Of course. Yeah. Uh, good teachers. The, the, the whole experience. I remember my senior year, these people saying, I can't wait, people saying to me, I, I can't wait to get out of here. I want to get a mm -hmm. job, get in the real world. And, I hate that expression. The real world. It's overrated. Yeah, <laughs> is it ever? And the other world is real too. But um, and I said, "Are you crazy? Do you know how good you got it here? This is never going to happen to you again." And uh, so, yeah. Oh, no, mm -hmm. I just uh, dearly love. It sounds almost like what Robert Bork described in a very different context as an intellectual feast. Yeah. Huh. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or as I once described Notre Dame, it's uh, academic Disney World. Yeah. <laughs> um, political science. Why? Is that Mr. Morgan's influence? Yeah, um, Is that too simple? Maybe by default. Yeah. It, it really... A literature would have been uh, a better fit. Uh, to the kind of things that I was interested in. Or philosophy, looking back. Or you philosophy. Um, but I hadn't had much of an introduction to philosophy. I had done a lot of... Um, I guess what I would now describe as philosophical inquiries, but they were uh, oblique. It wasn't uh, direct. Um, I had had... And at Duke, the entire time at Duke, I had one course uh, in philosophy. Which I really regret now. Mm -hmm. One of the disadvantages of being on a Navy scholarship is that you had certain requirements that ended up eating up some of your, uh, some of the courses you could have taken. Um, I kind of stumbled into political science. It wasn't. It was almost like stumbling into the law. I'm not sure what the influences mm -hmm. were there. I was interested in it. Um, but no, I don't really, I don't know exactly why I did that. It may very well have been that Morgan's course was so delightful that I thought, well, of course, I should continue with that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is mid-60s. Uh, Let me tell you an interesting story about Morgan. Please do. And um, we saw him, we, Laney and I, my wife, uh, saw him at a reunion I went to two of the high school reunions. I don't go to them anymore, but I don't know. I just uh, And the first time we saw him, I was with Laney. Now, Laney's 
Lee I met at law school. Uh, she didn't finish her law degree. She took a leave of absence and never went back. Um, <clears throat> Laney's boyfriend before me, Mike McLemore, who went to Druid Hills and who was one of uh, Robert Morgan's favorites, as I have been one of mm -hmm. his favorites. So it's just a strange connection. Laney had no other connection with Georgia other than through Mike McLemore. She, she was a Maryland girl. So we go to the party. And Morgan welcomes me, and we chat, and everything else. And um, he said, uh, "He said, oh, I'm so glad to see you." And it's just the three of us, or others. He said, "You know, I'm going to tell you this, Jack. I think you were my favorite student of all time." Oh goodness! How kind of you to say that. And does that include <laughs> Mike McLemore? <laughs> he said. Yes. <laughs> well, well, well you, you, you won twice. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great story. Just by chance. Yeah. By the way, um, Morgan was gay. And uh, his partner uh, was a teacher at the high school, too. Um, everybody knew that they were gay. Nobody paid any attention to it at Druid Hills. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You, you, you'd think that long ago that would yeah. have been that would have been an issue. Yep. Yeah. Um, campuses in the late '60s um, were uh, volatile places. Right. Um, you were at Duke in the mid '60s. '63, '67. Yeah. Did was there? What was the campus atmosphere? like there. I mean, well, it was in the process of changing. Yeah. In part because of the Beatles. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Beatles were coming along and people started growing their hair and, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was, it was, I didn't really think it was the music that was changing. But well, was it an activist campus? I mean, did they have it was protests? Activist, it was activist, but um, of course there wasn't a war in, uh, until later, I guess. 66, when people started thinking about the war. Um, the activist campus was um, mostly labor stuff, and particularly the workers at Duke. Hmm. So the students would hold rallies about uh, the wages being paid to the people who were cleaning up their rooms. Um, and you can wonder about the various motivations behind that, yeah. but it was a good thing. Uh, and yes, we had people come in and clean up our rooms every day. <laughs> different world. A different world in all sorts of respects. Not only that they're coming in, but then the, the, the mostly affluent, I assume, kids mm -hmm. cared. Yeah, they did. Um, and there, were, there, were, there would be rallies, uh, and, and that spilled over to doing labor sort of work um, in Durham. Durham is not the town uh, then that it is now. Durham was a poor little cow town but mm -hmm. struggling uh, back in the 60s. Nothing much of interest in Durham. There's a story that when uh, Duke Law School was founded, Duke is not a very old law school, when Duke Law School was founded, the first dean, I can't think of his name right now, he would go out recruiting students, recruiting faculty, try to build his law school. He would bring them to Duke, but he would take them over to Chapel Hill. He never took them into Durham. He'd say, well, this is where you, you'd want to live. And Chapel Hill was like it is now. It was a college town and good restaurants and interesting place and, and the like. Mm -hmm. um, but they would, so they would do work. And it was mostly with uh, black communities in, uh, in, uh, in Durham. Mm -hmm. uh, now a lot of students weren't involved at all, uh, but as far as the activism, that was it was it was that sort of focus. Mm -hmm. Pete Seeger would come to campus. I, I think I saw him three, maybe four times. Um, once on the stage with him, he, they put up chairs around, and I'm sitting up on the stage there. He asked that it be done that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we're sitting up on the stage with Pete Seeger, and he's. Mm -hmm. Uh, encouraging people at Duke to do 
what they were doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly that kind of work. And, and it really just kind of right on the cusp of, mm -hmm. um, of, of what the campuses became. Now remember that in 68, which some say is the most interesting year in America's history, I was in Vietnam. <laughs> Well, and, and, and we're going to get to that in, in, all of that. Well, in, 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 in just a minute. Uh, and, but, you know, so your time at Duke is coming to an end. You know your friends are crazy wanting to get out. You're looking at active duty, right? Yeah. Uh, now, remember, during the summers, I'm in the military. So um, uh, the first summer was that cruise I was telling you about. It mm -hmm. was uh, called uh, People to People. Uh, cruise um, of Northern Europe, uh, which sounds delightful, and it was once you got off the ship. <laughs> it wasn't. Other than the cruise part, the cruise uh, was fun. Cruise part, yeah. yeah. So I, uh, we went to uh, Antwerp, uh, Oslo, uh, Southampton. Um, uh, went into Paris. The, 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 our, our own trips into Paris. When I got off the uh, the ship at uh, Southampton. Wandering around the city, bumped into um, English older English couple. I think I had my uniform on. I probably did. And uh, came up to me and and said, "You're an American, right? And he, and you're in the military." He said, "Yes." He said, "How long have you got?" I said, "We're going to be here three days." He said, "I'm taking care of you." <laughs> so he took me to restaurants. Mm. He took me tour the countryside and everything else. Um, because the Americans had been so good to him during the war. Yeah. Yeah, I'd had a similar experience oh. when I was over there. Yeah. Yeah, the gratitude of that gratitude. generation. Yeah, and expressed it's, in a very personal way. Isn't that interesting? Well, the, um, th th this is probably a good time to, to, to s mm -hmm. switch to talk about your experience in Vietnam. It's probably also a good time for us to take a, a couple of minutes here, uh, but I think when we when we come back and after we've stretched our legs a little bit, I, I, sure. I want to ask you about what it was like to be in Vietnam in sure. the late 60s. Okay. All right.